We produce uh, weekly magazines, which are mostly science news and interviews with the different scientists on the different topics. But we also produce features, which is completely different. It involves a large group of people in production and script, scripts write, and sometimes we use actors and other people. So this is a much more wide uh, storytelling than uh, usual science writing for print or for uh, online media. And also it's not like producing a podcast for web or uh, even a show for web. And how is it uh, um, to get your directors involved in science, you know, that is the question most journalists ask. Uh, yeah, uh, in, uh, because I work at the television Belgrade, which is a, a Serbian broadcasting corporation in Serbia, which is our public service, and we are funded by taxpayers' money. So uh, public service has an obligation to produce a science and education program. That's the, that's the easy part. So we have uh, some kind of uh, percentage of the program that we need to produce. And I think that uh, we are some of the rare uh, public service programs in Europe. And I can uh, also say worldwide uh, that uh, we are still having a regular production of the program. It's not in that uh, um, that much as it used to be because this is a, we have a 50 years long tradition actually we celebrated a couple of months ago uh, 50 years of uh, science program from television belgrade uh, in uh, from that time we had much more space uh, on, on television now we have a less but we also keep uh, with our program and keep producing it um, the lucky part is that we don't have to um, consider us, we are not a commercial program, so we don't have to pay that much attention on audience, but we also have an uh, obligation to our viewers. So this is, uh, we are trying to, we are not competing with the commercial uh, stations, but uh, we are the unique uh, program because other private uh, stations with national frequency, they are not developing either science or either education programs. So we are the only ones. And uh, for these 50 years, we also recently opened a new, just uh, for science dedicated cable channel, which is also uh, in Serbia broadcasting network. Uh, regarding the, to, uh, to have a voice uh, and uh, to talk to our CEOs about importance of uh, science program being out there and producing science program. It's not that much about the, con uh, the program, it's about the content. And what we struggle, we struggle uh, for the content and we struggle to have some prime times, uh, um, you know, it's, it's hard to compete with the drama series or with the entertainment show if you want to put something there and if you want to be at, uh, in the level with them and fight for the same audience. It's not the same, but we are, that, that's the struggle that we are in with our CEOs. Every time that someone, some, if there is a new CEO and it's usually every four years. <laughs> so. That's, and do you think you challenge. can give some tips for for uh, science journalists uh, across Europe uh, to have more space in their news media and particularly in in t on the TV? Mm -hmm. For yeah. for example, in Portugal, I don't think we have science shows like you are uh, regularly like regularly like mm -hmm. you are uh, talking about. Maybe you have some interviews once in a while, and now with the coronavirus, we are having m much more mm -hmm. science on the TV, but we don't have a science show like yours. Any tips? Uh, yeah, uh, I think that this is something uh, about uh, trying to raise the voice. What what we are doing, and we because there is there is always a challenge. If they are going to cut some program, they are going to cut science education, uh, environmental uh, program development, because they are not commercial programs. That's, that's the usual. We'll, we'll have our entertainment shows, realities, and uh, drama show, but there is no 
commercial value to what you produce. But the, the thing is that uh, audience, we, we are, in a way we are lucky because our audience wants that. And because they're paying for the, for, for the public broadcaster, they have a say. So uh, when you ask someone, anyone here on the streets, they like to watch science, they like to be informed, they, they want to know more, especially now. And uh, nowadays, it, it somehow it shows that, uh, the value of science journalism and importance of science journalism being in the part of media, like having a special uh, newsroom for science journalists, because th there is also uh, what we see here, we here see a little bit of problem, uh, the newsroom, how the newsrooms are covering uh, the COVID-19 uh, topic because um, in newsroom you know that you have a general reporters there and they can write about almost anything but the thing is that uh, for this matter it shows that there is lo a lot of aspects that only science journalists who are trained in medical or health journalism can deliver and this is something that they're becoming aware now of and they're inviting uh, some freelance science journalists to join for a special occasion in covering in covering the pandemic. So this is a, this is now the issue, and also it uh, it opened other issues. It opened the uh, topics that they are not covered. So the the topics that we are we have to cover more in the future, such as climate change, for example. And this is uh, what we always say because I'm an editor in a science program and we are mostly editors there um, but we are also science journalists so that's that's the voice that we all we are all trying to be um, united in this message that we need to be present and we need to be more involved in uh, producing the program and being then there even in newsrooms so like you like you were just saying it don't have just to convince your CEO that science uh, is reporting and science shows are important, but also your fellow journalists in the newsroom. So how, how do you think you could manage to be more tight together uh, with them? Is it so hard or do you think it, there's a way to do it, to teach or to help journalists? In a way, it's a, it's a strange situation because when you, when you, see in the newsroom is you have uh, people who are covering finances and economics and they are like journalists just for that but when you say you're a science journalist and they, they, the, the colleague the other colleagues are what is that <laughs> in a way like okay how is that different to the other stories that i cover but it's different because you went from uh, some trainings you need to have it's completely and as you know it it's completely different in a way. So this is this is strange because it's a uh, we. I like to say that we represent a new generation in science uh, of science journalists because uh, everything is different in media now, and we need to collaborate with our colleagues, uh, with the other reporters in the newsroom, which was uh, not uh, like that before. There was, uh, in a way, there was no need. Everything was slower. There was no internet there, and. Uh, uh, technology was not developing that much. You didn't have that much science uh, uh, there. Um, research take long. Uh, you just have to report uh, here and there on that, or if there is something which is uh, like uh, mission, some Apollo mission, and other things. They can be like uh, newsworthy, but other other. But I'm talking television are uh, slow productions, they can take long and it's almost like you, you can um, rerun it anytime because you know those research take forever like 10, 20, 30 years of some, some research if you, if you want to follow them so it's not uh, out of age tomorrow with the news is different so this is everything is faster and everything is developing, so we need this synergy in the newsrooms with different uh, speci specialized journalists. Uh, now science journalists are, I think, uh, important because of the whole, I can easily say new year that we are entering. 
and we are entering it very suddenly in a way though we were aware who, who was covering uh, medical and health journalism and other life sciences we, we are aware of this uh, we were we were already reporting of these possibilities but now we are we are actually living it and it's it's challenging and it's developing different views and different uh, tools that you can explore and how you can deliver your story either for television or for print or for any any outlet internet what is there so you know, i i can advise uh, fellows uh, science journalists to be more vocal and to be there to be in there the faces of any ceo any editor of the program on television radio wherever and uh, say how this is important one of, one of the things that people usually ask me, scientists and science communicators that want to, to have their story on the news, is how do they reach us, us being uh, journalists? And to be in a, in a printed media like me or to be in, uh, on a TV like you, it's totally different. So what would be your advice for uh, scientists and science communicators to reach the TV? What do they need to do? Uh, the for us from my experience uh here uh, it's uh, uh, very important to build bridges and to be in a constant communication and uh, to keep close because for example uh, when i'm doing my show which is weekly it's going to be weekly and other shows i i have collaborations with different uh, institutions with different faculties universities other researchers and i need to be informed all the time what's going on in their in their sector so this is something like uh, there there are not much people here because this is the small environment but the thing is to be in a regular communication and to follow up what are they doing and how are the situation and to be there uh, when it happens, it's very important for, for us to deliver uh, the story and to be uh, original in a way we present it. So this is, uh, this is something what I like to do. I like to be in, uh, in contact with our science communicators, with our public relations for different uh, institutions. So I keep up the... Uh, I, I like to know what's going on all the time. That's, that's, the, that's the thing. So. I want to be kept in loop all the time. And I think that's, that's the way to do it. And yeah, that's how you build bridges, yeah. With different, uh, with different people and uh, in constant communication. Can you tell me more about those collaborations? How do you settle them? How do you reach, uh, we, we, reach uh, you or what besides, kind of collaboration? Besides, the, besides the, uh, the regular program that we produce and the, the, those are our uh, science stories uh, um, series that we produce on different topic and I, I can say that we mostly cover life sciences, uh, medicine, health, uh, physics, astrophysics and those uh, and a little bit of social sciences uh, also. The, what we like to do is explore the partnerships and we had a very good partnership uh, with Br British Council and the things that they're doing about uh, education and new technologies. So this is something that we explore and we deliver the, for example, FameLab competition was on TV here, the national one. And after that, uh, because of the success of this competition here, we developed the scientific affair series which are actually the best, uh, the winners of uh, FameLab competition were actually the hosts. So we would invite scientists, we, uh, those uh, FameLab finalists will be a ho our host and there was in the audience. So it was like, uh, concept was like a keynote lecture of 15, 20 minutes and then 15 minutes Q and A. And it was very well received, uh, uh, from, with our in our audience because of the casual uh, environment that we filmed that we filmed at the actual cafe with lots of uh, students there and the other audience who were, who were interesting to participate 
And uh, that's how we build our collaboration. The other collaboration that we like to build, uh, we wanted to build is with the Science Festival here because it's a very big and huge, huge event, uh, regional event. Uh, it's yearly and what we did also uh, in partnership with the Science Festival, we built the studio in the festival. So that's, that was like we gave live uh, coverage of the festival during the festival. And it was really, really interesting. Uh, so many guests, so many speakers. You can um, interview any scientist who is there. Uh, other, uh, it was also very good for the audience. They responded very well to uh, this kind of productions. So th this is something we, we are looking what uh, our institutes have, if they have some research, if they have some program, which can be actually very interesting for our audience. And we try to build build with them the the story, the features, the the complete series, if if uh, if there is uh, enough uh, content for that. And uh, we like to collaborate with them with them uh, within our scripts in developing the scripts because you need uh, scientists to be present to fact check what you are actually is it accurate. And that's how we collaborate and we also, in a way, I can say we promote science in the best way because of their involvement in our, in our production as a special consultants for the content and the other, the other things that we, because we need to be very, very careful of what we produce and how accurate it is. And uh, that for that, we need support because uh, just uh, as science journalists, you, you don't know everything. So this is something that you need to consult. And you were also giving some training uh, for scientists yeah. and science communication. Yeah, that's, that, that was also TV. interesting. That, that's why I, 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 I call it the bridge because uh, we learn from them and they learn from us. And uh, in, when we were doing the fame lab competition, which was just like a presentation of uh, some science topic in front of the audience, what we tried to do with this format, building this format for TV, uh, we actually wanted to give the, for our, our science communicators, uh, element of uh, training for TV. So it was three minutes, like a stand up comedy, like show, like they do the stand up, but they are talking about science and it took three minutes in front of the audience and in front of the camera. So we, we did trainings for the, for the TV and uh, it was very well received. And after that, some of who were, wanted to pursue a career in television program, they explored the hosting of our shows that we developed or doing documentaries on uh, other stuff, uh, what they feel they like to do. And they're also very charismatic <laughs> with the audience and uh, audience like them because they are like uh, sci uh, scientists who are stars, you know, and it was very well received also. But I think for the science communicators, if they have the, that uh, they want to explore that, it's very good to have some, some uh, media training. Let me just interrupt our mm -hmm. conversation for, for a while and tell our audience if they want to ask you some questions, they can put the questions on the, ch on the chat box and we will ask you. So feel free to ask some, Melita some questions and then I will proceed with, with you asking you, you were saying that you produce shows that you, you find that your uh, audience wants and what are those um, what are the topics that your audience would prefer? It's always, uh, like, it's very interesting, but you can always uh, cover physics, astrophysics, uh, climate change, environment, everything on environment. Um, what else? Genetics, evolution. So there, there is a, like, Chemistry also, it's very interesting. Chemistry is one of the topics that they are very interesting in. So this is something, but it's not uh, easy to develop uh, a mathematics, which I find very, <laughs> very hard to deliver as a, you know, 
you can write on the, on the topic and everything. You do the research, it's okay. But when you, if you want to engage the audience, there is audio and video. And how do you do, how do you present mathematics? And that's challenge uh, for when you're working for TV uh, and you're producing shows. So th this is their very, public is always, and the uh, audience is always interesting in those. I, I think that you, about um, space, you, you can't have enough uh, shows. <laughs> there is uh, certainly, you can, you can broadcast it daily. So this is something. I was thinking about that because for TV, you always need some pictures, some good images yeah. to put on TV and not just the faces of yeah. people chatting. And so it takes time. It takes time to produce because astrophysics usually is, it's easy. <laughs> yeah, astrophysics is easy. But we were usually, we are usually doing animations. We try to do that. And there is also, also you need, you need to have every single right for what you broadcast. So, Either you are buying those uh, pictures or videos, or you are producing your own with the animations, which are original, and it takes time. So this is this is a slow production of program. But we have also those weeklies, which is just uh, like I said, science science news shows. But what we uh, had as a challenge uh, here uh, when the pandemic started and lockdowns. We developed completely new new program, and it was actually dedicating to education. Because uh, during uh, when everything started, somehow our our production was shut down, like many many productions all over, all over the world. So we decided to go with the reruns of our shows in science uh, science uh, program. But we delivered, uh, in collaboration with Ministry of uh, Education, the special my, my school content, which actually was uh, education uh, for elementary and high school uh, students uh, during the, the lockdown every day. So that, that was really challenging. It, it took more than a hundred people uh, to produce this, and it was set up uh, in less than seven days when every, when the schools were shut down, and we managed to produce daily program for every grade that there is in elementary school and the high school, and every subject. Uh, it was a modified, it was not like 45 minutes less lessons, it was uh, like uh, 30 minutes. And uh, there was like two and a half hours for every grade every day, besides uh, not during the weekends. And uh, also um, with the Ministry of Education, we developed different applications. So uh, those students, could uh, communicate with their own uh, teachers and do the, after that do the homeworks and do the exams and everything. So um, this was very, very successful uh, ad hoc built production of program. It, it's still going? Uh, it's going to be finished uh, next week. Okay. Because the school is finished, the final exams are. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, so uh, actually, um, students did, uh, did, didn't miss this uh, school year, which is good. Yeah, that, that, that sounds perfect. And you, you in your, you, the editors of your program were creating this? Uh, we, are, we, we were creating this, yes. You were the was, ones? Uh, uh, yeah, a couple, couple of us. Okay. Because uh, here we, in Portugal, we had teachers doing we, those no, classes. The teachers we, uh, okay. were doing those classes, but we selected the teachers. We selected who, not everyone can be on, the, on TV and uh, they have trouble. <laughs> they have, uh, with the, uh, speaking in public, you know, and uh, it's different. So we, we gave a small training for those teachers, but they, they were really brilliant. They did a uh, lot of work for themselves and it was really uh, hard for them because it was every day and it was uh, very intense. The whole filming uh, was very intense. 
but uh, what we learned from this because there is so much viewers and audiences not just students you know the whole family were watching the the those shows i can say shows because it's pro education program but um, now we are thinking about different formats and where our audience is and uh, what are we going to do in the future and how we can engage more with the audience and um, are you planning to have something like this um, in the future? I mean, we can have a second outbreak or something uh, and everyone can be closed at home again. If, are you planning, how will you do it? Or you will do just the same? Or are you planning in advance in case it happens? No, no, we are going to plan in advance because we didn't. <laughs> and it, it, it was really, you know, it was really like you're doing something in real time and there were of course some errors and uh, problems like uh, you something technical can happen anytime you can't uh, go live and you, <laughs> you have this this problem so this is something that you need to explore and overcome and usually we do that at the rehearsals because we when we before we start broadcasting our new for example weekly shows which are news like uh, we, rec we do the rehearsals a couple of them but uh, here we didn't have almost any there was no time and then that's what we learned and the other things so that that's now we are i think 70 percent prepared if something like this happens again there is a way and also uh, we developed uh, different platforms and much better communication with because it was uh, broadcasted all over the country and we didn't realize that uh, uh, okay in the city environments you have enough internet and you have a very good uh, very good uh, connections but in some parts you don't have it so there is a problem for the student to deliver the, the exam or those things so we need to think about those things too and uh, the funny the funny thing is also if you have for example um, children who are different grades and that means that some that you need to have actually two tvs <laughs> in, in, in your home so they can they can follow their grade and that, that's something that we actually okay so we didn't think about this so we needed to put the whole new structure of the broadcasting of the show because of the those uh, because you assume, <laughs> you just assume that there is like so many monitors, everyone has a smartphone and tablet and, but it's still not like that. So this is, this, uh, these are the lessons learned and the adjustments that we are going to make and we are making even now. So you had it both on the TV and online? Yes. Okay. Yes. And you can, you can, uh, look it on demand you can uh, look it on internet uh, you can rewind the lesson you can write down the whole um, paper that you need to submit and those things so of course that was not all everything on the first day <laughs> so we needed to we needed to adjust it took us for example 10 days to that for that to be perfect but uh, we did it, so I am glad <laughs> that it happened. And do you have a feedback from the audience? How do you know it's really it's really funny because now that we are not in lockdown and I can walk and uh, go to to the local store, I hear them talking about the teachers that they've seen and the lessons because uh, somehow it uh, it. Uh, took us back to elementary school, you know, even uh, we who were my colleagues and I, we were there uh, filming this and we were, okay, did we have this lesson and how was it? Was it like that uh, then? So it's, it's very interesting. It was really moving. So it's still like uh, they're talking about that, like, like real, uh, you know, entertainment show, which was not actually but they find it very, very uh, educational and entertaining, which is, uh, which is good for us, for, for our program. 
So I, I have some links here that we can uh, share with our audience. Just let me mm -hmm. um, get this ready. Uh, and maybe you can uh, explain us what we will be, will be seeing. Like here. Yeah. If you can turn the the audio yeah. off. Yeah. Yeah. It's off. It's off. Yeah. That's that's uh, that's the intro for my school, the program, mm -hmm. the education education program that we developed, is the announcement. And this is the, those are the links that how you can join it uh, via internet. Uh, so you can uh, you can see the schedule and look for your grade subject that you want to see and uh, all information is there i think we have a second one and, here yeah it's what you are you are seeing the second yes. one right now yeah and that's how we for the for the we broadcast it on the three channels our national channels tv and we also had it via uh, internet and uh, satellite. So this is uh, really huge. And, and also your cable. With there, there, this is how some of the illustrations have some of the lessons and teachers were doing with this. And this is how students actually followed it during the lockdown. So this, this, looks, um, th this looks like the teachers are at home, was it? Or they were in your studio? They were in our studio and okay. this is uh, pre-taped and broadcast and students are at home. Okay. Watching like they're in school. But they're alone, not with the, their fellow <laughs> students. Yeah. I, I also want to share some of other videos uh, you yeah. have shared with me. Uh, let's see if you are watching this now. Oh, this, this is a collaboration with the British Council. And this is uh, um, about new technologies and education. We have a couple of shows during the year which we cover about the topics of development, different uh, use of different technologies in education. And the uh, British Council organized annual uh, conference. And what we do, we also go live from the conference with the guests of the conference. Uh, and this is, this is uh, one of those shows that we delivered the, the whole, uh, we brought the, the whole production at the conference and follow the conference closely from, from the venue. That's, that's what we like to do in this special programs that we deliver. And this is also very well received from the audience. We have another one. Mm -hmm. Another one is, uh, this is uh, Marsha Evans, the astronaut. Okay. And she was a guest of the, our science festival. And it's, it's also an example of uh, our build, uh, studio build in the, in the festival area. Uh, so we can go live from there. And no, not anyone, but we like to bring everyone who is interesting to our studio and to tell their stories. So this is, this is also what uh, our, and this festival is very well, uh, uh, it's filled with uh, the people and it has, it, it takes four days, but it has like 40,000 uh, 40, uh, attendees. Wow. So it's very, it's very big. And that's how we build the whole, uh, the whole studio in, in the area of the festival. Okay, so you, ha you have also here some videos about uh, FemLab? 
Yeah, that's that's the Fame Lab uh, uh, competition that we used to do with the British Council, but we developed our our own uh, national national uh, competition, and this is studio that we built for our um, the science communicators who wanted to participate in the Fame Lab competition, the national one. And we were lucky to have also the international winner, which was Mirko Giorgio, he's, that's, that's the guy, <laughs> in 2009. So when we went to the Telton Science Festival, he won the first prize for his talk on um, sexual evolution, because he's a biologist. And recently, he, he is working here at the Research Center for Biology. And Is this one or the other one? Uh, the, I think that you're going to show yeah, this one. It's him. And he's really like audience loved him because he was so, so funny. And uh, uh, what we tried to do, in, this is the parts of the training that we did for them, for our science communicators. We would go to a retreat in the mountain and for three days and do the trainings for television um appearances and uh, we tried to explain uh, to try them to build the stories and tell the story without if there is a possibility without props to engage the the whole audience if the if subject is like that if they're talking about for example he's talking uh, biology uh, for the chemists is obvious that they are going to use props but we were trying to to get them to be very interesting without props if it's if it's possible and there is a countdown clock for that that we made so this is something that was really like over, over two two million viewers and it was a prime time in the evening show so and here it's him uh... and here is here is uh, what happened in cheltenham and he's delivering this the whole um, whole speech in English, the whole stand up, <laughs> stand up, science stand up in okay. English. And it was really, really something. But those are the experiments that we like to do in the program, especially me. I like to deliver this, 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 uh, something that uh, in the communication uh, part, I like to collaborate with different, uh, with different people so they can give their views and uh, make it more uh, let, let's say casual so we can we can present science in a casual way not strict you know uh, like that and i think that the audience like that i like it so so everyone everyone is happy <laughs> so um I would like to change a bit our topic. I see that uh, um, our, our audience uh, is not asking questions, so I will keep asking you the questions. <laughs> and I would like to ask you about the World Federation of Science Journalists. What are, it's the uh, uh, federation meant to be? How can they help science journalists and science communicators? Also because uh, SciCompete is part of the mm -hmm. World Federation. Yeah. so. Tell me about it. I think that you know that the uh, Federation is a really unique organization. Uh, we are a unique community uh, and we are a very diverse community. Um, I, I can't, I don't know the actual accurate number of languages that are spoken in the Federation, but it's many. And we also, represent different regions, different countries all over the world. And what else is interesting is that we practice different uh, science journalism. So it's, uh, it's also either broadcast or print online, or uh, we are science writers. There you can find everyone in our community. Also, we have collaborations with science communicators, uh, as you know, and we tried to to build bridges and network with the science communicators too. But uh, our main goal is promotion of science journalism and uh, our profession. 
is especially now nowadays because uh, I think it's very important uh, to be present in media to deliver the right messages and to be very critical of what we report and that's what we try to do and I think that we are unique in that <laughs> uh, I can speak for my colleagues in, in the board of uh, federation because we speak regularly. Um, but I think that of, for our membership also, I can say that are, we are on the same page for that, that it's very important to preserve science journalism and our places in media. Yeah, th that is what uh, actually what we are trying to figure out here in Portugal because we have such few science journalists and we are getting less and less uh, just this year since it's the beginning of the year at least two more uh, fellow science journalists just quit and went to to the press office and um, but actually what I've seen is that uh, everyone was covering uh, COVID-19 so every journalist even if they were uh, specialized in politics or finances everyone had to be doing it and at least in my news media it didn't work so badly so is this a chance for us to have uh, more science journalists better science journalism even if it's not made by science journalists i would say so what i find very interesting is to uh, to try to convince editors which are not uh, science editors, the editors who are there in the newsrooms, how important it is to engage uh, and call uh, there from time to time uh, col and collaborate with the science journalists on different topics. Um, as I said before, it, it didn't seem like a normal thing uh, and they didn't think about it, but now I think that they are becoming aware of this situation that it's very important what you um, write or say about, especially this pandemic, that you need uh, experts on that and you have a qualified uh, science journalist who are doing those stories and have a back very solid background in the covering the infectious diseases. So this is something that you, for your safety as an editor, you would call one of those people to join you. <laughs> and I think that there is opportunity for uh, what I find, uh, I, I have find challenging in this uh, uh, period uh, of pandemic is how to deliver other science stories, because it seems that there, there are no space for any other story in the dailies. And uh, since we are not producing regularly our program still, we are going to, I hope we are going to start from July again, but now we are in um, standby mode. So this is something that um, was bothering me and I, I was planning of uh, what stories I'm going to produce and topics that we are, I'm going to uh, deliver. And I'm thinking, okay, there is no much now there. And I think it should be because uh, audience is also looking for something else than, than COVID regarding science <laughs> regarding science and there is from time to time something okay again space and astrophysics but the, but uh, and uh, here and there climate change but uh, you can't find anything else maybe something and um, of archaeology or anthropology but there is no much there I don't know about you, but uh, our scientists are locked down at home also. Yeah. And they're, for, they're... for the first couple of weeks of lockdown, not even no more science news, but no more news on other topic besides mm -hmm. COVID yes. anyway. It, nothing else was happening. So it, yeah. it was pretty much the same. Milica, uh, I don't yes. know if you would like to add something else. I'm very pleased with this interview. I don't know if what what final advice uh, would you give to our uh, science journalists and science communicators that are listening to us? I think for science journalists that they have to fight for their space and try to find a way how they are going to be published, or even to to do their own productions or pod, uh, podcasts and. Uh, 
bring themselves out there in the media so uh, someone can hopefully see them and ask them to join uh, i hope some bigger desks that they need coverage of uh, science for science communicators i would wish them to communicate more with the with media and us and build bridges so we can do a lot on uh, promotion of science but uh, what we want to do as a science journalist we need to be very critical about it and see all the angles and follow the story and uh, not the scientists as they are so this is something that uh, we need to do in collaboration all of us who are very keen on science and interesting in following science okay thank you very much thank you for thank you. your tips and thank you for that uh, your message was of hope <laughs> and i hope we can we can manage i i'm also having this message of hope even if i see uh, newsrooms going down um uh so oh here now we have a question after yeah. <laughs> um so it, it's uh, one question from our audience it has been said that covid 19 pandemic is an amazing opportunity to finally debunk anti-vaxxer myths mm -hmm. do you agree with this idea i agree with the idea and i think that uh, we should really focus on how to how to try to suppress the pseudoscience in media which is uh, which is uh, published uh, almost every day on diff in all different medias and somehow I, I i think those people have much more free time than the others so so we are we are trying to do our jobs and be very accurate about it and now you have those not just anti-vaxxers but you have uh, flat earth you have 5g you have other other <laughs> stories that they're broadcasting all over the social networks so i think that the, there is we should always um try to remember that we need to address those uh, those uh, elements who are promoting something which is actually not uh, science-based Actually, uh, this question was br brought up by Andreas Gitswatch. Um, uh, and actually, it made me think about another thing. In this pandemic, you have more, you have lots of myths coming out. We are at Observador, we are fact checking, you have other organizations fact checking, and it looks like the spread of myths and yeah. just was as pandemic as uh, the, the, the yeah. virus how can we keep up with this uh, i mean us science journalists and science communicators yeah. it's terribly difficult to keep up with this uh, what i found strange in the in the media and also with the editors of different uh, different uh, newspapers how they are eager to publish this because of the um, commercial values of this uh, and uh, those uh, apocalyptic you know titles and everything they are just click bite elements uh, all the time and they are aiming for that but the, uh, it got me thinking okay how how far can you go with this because it's it's really all over the place now uh, it was it was before but now somehow they they felt the threat of everything so now it's uh, like three times bigger all different myths so this is <laughs> no, no, we are not in a position science journalists to be like a mid bus uh, you know like the show that was <laughs> that was uh once produced but i think that we should in a way we should try to be aware and try to um put some thoughts and maybe deliver some uh, articles about these conspiracy theories and everything which is um in a way i find i i put it in a showbiz folder <laughs> you know because it's always with the 
popular faces and uh, those uh, ridiculous ideas that they get in their heads. Yeah, we are debunking at our news media and other medias in, in Portugal. We, we are debunking this myth mm -hmm. and some are so obvious, like <laughs> if you stop breathing, uh, you can uh, understand if you caught yeah. the coronavirus or not. So they are uh, as ridiculous as that. But then as science journalists, I'm facing another difficulty now. Now that the, the big thing is over, now you, you start getting some uh, papers, some preprints, and one say one thing is good, the other say another thing is good, and sometimes you even have them um, published by good uh, uh, teams or in good yeah. um, uh, um, um, journals, and this will be that's a really hard. hard time for science journalists. Yes, that's hard. You need to read everything, and you need to be. Um careful like you're always careful but now you, you need to be more careful when you read this and uh, in this situation you have so many research uh, done on uh, on uh, coronavirus uh, and covid it's more than 23000 of uh, studies and uh, there we are actually following the results in real time they are doing the studies in the real time so I know that they didn't get the peer reviews and they didn't get the proper uh, proper revision of the from the experts because it's uh, it's very time uh, sensitive. But uh, um, that's the it's a good thing that they're producing such uh, amount of studies. But the other thing is this critical va value and accuracy on this, and that's how you get mixed uh, data. And everything that you okay, this is it. But when you read something else, it it doesn't seems like it. So you need to find the, all the gray areas where where you can actually report on on something like this. So it's very hard. But I think it's going to uh, in a way because everything is uh, like we are in the moment now. I think that in a couple of months uh, those things will settle down, and some there is going to be some clarity on the issues. For example, for testings uh, on COVID and the different uh, statistics of uh, test positive, uh, false negatives, and other other things that we tried to. I read so many because I was uh, writing the special feature for our um, news magazine that uh, it's printing. That we have very good collaboration with Center of Promotion of Science here, which is also one of. Uh, for science communicators and they're publishing, they have their science magazine and they're publishing four times a year. And they always ask science journalists to, to cover some topics. So I was delivering like some 15,000 characters on that. So I read almost everything and it was really confusing when you have, when you want to write a story and uh, write the overview of the pandemic, uh, there is always a problem what to put there. As, and to sign your name <laughs> on that uh, <laughs> on that text. I, I was just speaking with a scientist before and he was telling me, like you were saying, it is happening now and we are reporting on that. And he's, he was saying like, only in the end, we will be able to look back and do the cleaning, you know, yes. to clean yes. all the, the wrong information that yes. we were spreading yes. these days, even the scientists and, and scientific mm -hmm. papers. Yes. We have another comment. It's not really a question, it's a comment from Diana Barbosa. Uh, mm -hmm. There's an urgent need for consortiums <clears throat> so that efforts mm -hmm. can be divided between different outlets and the banking you know, to, to spread massively. Um, yeah. There's a consortium, the International uh, Fact Checking Network. Yeah. But do you think uh, that uh, news media will be able to, to get together to work on this or are we fighting too much on our audience to be able to do it? I think that we, can, we have to <laughs> lean on our audience, but we can also try to present the, the because uh, you know media uh, all over the different countries they are different. They, they have different rules. They are doing their fact checking different, and uh, this is something that uh, with one outlet there is a problem if they are going to consult with that or not. But uh, if 
uh, we pursue it in that uh, direction, I'm all, also confident that at some point um, they are going to adjust uh, to this element and try to try to uh, check <laughs> check the consortium. Uh, but uh, there is one uh, initiative, and help me remember now, the, the Spanish uh, made, you know, that we wanted to invite them um, to our panel, and they did a great job. I don't this, remember uh, the name, but we will then share it in a link. Yes, uh, to because our, they, uh, yes? They, they did a great thing of uh, putting their everything, which is pseudoscience, and uh, I thank them for that, the, the, those gr that group of scientists, because they, it's, very, it's very important for us, for me, for example, the job that I do, to consult with them on this matter. And I think it's, it's a huge deal. Okay. I'm sorry that I can't remember the name of the... No, I, I will look for it also. <laughs> I, I can't remember also. I will look for it and I will share it uh, on our, our uh, social media so people can know about it also. I think it's important that we have uh, all these resources and, and also the World Federation. You have um, uh, 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 some resources, you are gathering some resources on COVID-19 also to help science journalists, yeah. Yeah. right? We, because of uh, uh, our membership asks us and we are also happy to say that we build this uh, WFSJ briefing page uh, in a short period of time and there, there we put their resources, papers that we checked and uh, uh, articles of our colleagues uh, in the community. So uh, we, we were thinking for, uh, of our community, it's open to the general public, but we were also thinking about the general reporters who are actually asked in their, uh, uh, from their editors to cover uh, pandemic so they can, I, we hope they can consult with our uh, web uh, site WFSJ briefing on that. Okay, Milica. Thank you very much. I, Thank you. I, no, we have another question. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Every time I'm saying, okay, <laughs> now we'll finish, good we guess, <laughs> get another one. But that is good. That is good. Keep going. Yeah. So we have Vasco Trigu asking, because of COVID-19, we've seen so much more researchers showing on the media than ever before. Yeah. What, was this because the media needed and asked them uh, it was a reactive attitude, or was it because they saw an opportunity to be a protagonist, uh, like more of an active attitude? A little bit of both. Uh, media needed uh, experts to be there and to to give their voice and explain the, what's going on. But there is always <laughs> someone who who sees it uh, as it opportunity for themselves and that's how for example here we actually uh, got one who is very prominent uh, doctor but he's completely anti-vaxxer and uh, all those things so it did more damage than good so this is something that <laughs> it happens you have it everywhere around the world so um, that I think that's the responsibility of the media editors and journalists and hosts who invite those people to, to check the experts and uh, their all aspects of their lives if you, if you can because of these situations, you know, they, you're not just uh, there to explain, you invite them to explain the COVID-19, but actually they will, they know how to use time and broadcast themselves and their uh, issues and what they stand for. And it can be tricky. <laughs> so this is, this is something that you need to be, especially in TV, um, very careful. Who do you invite uh, to talk about the certain topics? It's not just uh, on COVID-19. Yeah, but, but... I know what I get what you are saying because we suddenly and this was discussed in our last session last week uh, when you have some supposed experts talking to the media and okay 
we, the journalists, know nothing about the virus or this virus, some scientists either. So some scientists are, have different opinion from each other's. And then sometimes you just think, okay, this guy has different opinion, but it's well structured. Uh, only after you broadcast it, people come to say, this, this is uh, not, this is fake. He's not an expert yeah. and so on. And you get like, oh, what, what can we do about it um, after we failed <laughs> and to prevent that we fail? Uh, after we fail, we need to to try to forget as fast as possible <laughs> because uh, tomorrow is another day and, so, and the audience is going to watch something else. But uh, next time, uh, try to invite someone else who is really valid and can deliver. So, so try to do the damage control in the next, uh, if you get the next chance. <laughs> so, uh, need to, I, I think that it's always good to do a follow-up with a different voice and try to be completely different if possible. So we have another question from Andreas Wittsuarez. Oh, wait, we have another one from Vasco Trig, the same person that asked, uh, Oh, he, he yeah, is asking if, if yeah. they were offering themselves to yeah, contribute yeah, to the media. Uh, we get different kind of... Uh, you have people who, who are, uh, get our addresses and contact us directly and try to get themselves out, out there. But that's something that we usually don't follow. Uh, we try to follow science and we try to follow the names that uh, they have a credibility and someone can vouch for them. So this is uh, usually when you get these kinds of calls and someone is persists to be there, you see uh, opportunists. So it's not uh, in general like that, but most of the times, especially in these special situations, you know, that's, that's a trigger for those. Yes, I get, I, I, I get the same. <laughs> so from Andreas Vitsuarez, WhatsApp and Telegram have been widely used in Brazil to spread fake news. Mm -hmm. In which ways we as science journalists could creatively use these closed groups to convey our evidence-based messages? Uh, I'm not sure if WhatsApp yeah. is working the same way everywhere because this is the case mm -hmm. in Brazil, but probably not the case. It's a tricky Portugal. one. It's a tricky one uh, when they have their groups, for example, here anti vaxxers they're very, very strong group, you know, and they're close group. And if you try to engage in conversation with them, there is no way they're going, they're always broadcasting the same, the same old story. And they're very prepared for that. And they like this kind of um, attention that they're getting. Um, what we are trying here to do is to, in a way, ignore them, not to put them in the same room with us, uh, with the other, uh, with science, <laughs> and try to deliver science. So, so we use our space in program. If we have 30 minutes, we are, you, we are going to use it for science. We are not going to give any space to the others because they have other other spaces in entertainment shows and different. Uh, so I think in social media is it could be the same, and maybe is the way, uh, the way is to have a separate groups like we have for science. We have separate groups uh, for everything, and that's how we communicate. They can see uh, what's going on there, and they usually they usually read that but to engage with those groups i don't find it uh, uh, th there is no use and i think that our audience is there and we need to be uh, there for our audience and to deliver the accurate uh, topic and everything for them so they can decide and not to engage with uh, with the others because this is not science and there is no place to to spend time on, on them. Yeah, I agree. We cannot just pick people and shake them and say, this is not yeah. the good information, this is the good information. Uh, you're right. So I found what we were looking for. Um, 
um, I will say it in Portuguese mm -hmm. <laughs> because mm -hmm. I, will, I cannot speak Spanish. And mm -hmm. the name is Associação para Proteger o Doente de Terapia. De, pseudo, de terapias pseudocientíficas uh, and they have written a, a European manifest against yeah. pseudotherapy. I, I already shared uh, uh, my fellow that are on Facebook, they will share the, the link with our audience also they can check on this uh, and this association uh, you mentioned it was uh, it was a good choice to mention this as we are also uh, partners the Red Psychompete is also a partner with the Spanish uh, associations of science communicators we already uh, engage in Iberian meetings of science journalists and science communicators so it's good to to yeah. get together with fellows that are uh, thinking the same and doing uh, similar stuff. I like that and I appreciate that manifesto very much. Okay. It's, for me, that's a good example of how, how you, we should do things. This, this is the approach. Okay. I guess we are not having any more questions, but we were already uh, talking for more than an hour, so I think really? uh, yes, <laughs> I, I think it was very good. I'm very thankful that you accepted our invitation, Milica. It's always thank a you for to inviting you. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. And I will just uh, excuse me, but I will say uh, goodbye okay. um, uh, in uh, in um, uh, in Portuguese. Um, okay. I just got here uh, uh, a message, another message just that saying that we are in Portugal, we are gathering some uh, signatures for that manifesto also. Oh, great. Uh, so great. <laughs> uh, I will just say goodbye in Portuguese. And goodbye uh, <laughs> uh, from <laughs> Chega ao fim esta, esta nossa sessão uh, em direto uh, na, no Congresso SciCom PT 2020 online. O Congresso começou no dia 7 de maio e vai durar até dia 18 de junho. Vamos ter sessões em direto todas as quintas-feiras. Esta, excepcionalmente, acontece numa sexta-feira. Tivemos alguns, algumas dificuldades técnicas que, 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 que se mantiveram por hoje, mas o vídeo uh, estará disponível no, no YouTube. Os vídeos de, de, dos, no, dos nossos participantes, vídeos de três minutos, também estão a ser publicados todos os dias uh, no, no YouTube. O congresso este ano, devido à pandemia, acontece exclusivamente online e é totalmente uh, gratuito para todos os participantes e para todas as pessoas que se interessem por comunicação de ciência. Temos a possibilidade de quem quiser uh, se inscrever no congresso Uh, com uma taxa de inscrição à, à escolha do, do participante pode fazê-lo, é, é a forma que nós temos uh, que criamos para poderem apoiar o, o congresso esperemos sinceramente que estejam a gostar e vemos-nos em breve, adeus adeus <risos>